Good evening and welcome to this Advent webinar sponsored by You Catholic and Catholic Distance University. My name is Anna Mitchell. I'm host of the Sunrise Morning Show, which you can hear Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 in the morning, the first hour of which is syndicated on EWTN radio and I'll be moderating tonight's discussion. Uh, before we get to introducing all of our panelists, I thought we could open with um, today's O Antiphon from Evening Prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O flower of Jesse's stem, you have been raised up as a sign for all peoples. Kings stand silent in your presence. The nations bow down and worship before you. Come, let nothing keep you from coming to our aid. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Now, I would like to welcome today's panelists. Very happy to have along uh, four instructors with Catholic Distance University tonight. Dr. Peter Brown, first off, is academic dean for Catholic Distance University, teaches sacred scripture and biblical studies. Dr. Matthew Bunsen is with us. He's faculty chair for Catholic Distance University, teaches history and church history. Dr. Carol Brown is with us over the phone and will be contributing as her voice allows. She's the director of the Office of the New Evangelization for the Diocese of Oklahoma City and teaches Catholic spirituality for Catholic Distance University. And Alan Wright is academic dean at St. Paul Inside the Walls in the Diocese of Patterson, New Jersey, also an instructor with CDU. And he's got a special seminar coming up in January that Professor Wright, I'm going to have you talk about uh, toward the end of this webinar, if that's all right with you. So that's welcome that's to, to all of you. Thank you. Um, just a quick note for anyone uh, who is participating tonight, watching the webinar, listening in. If you have a question and if you think of it at any time during tonight's webinar, please feel free to uh, write in questions. Um, there is a question tab on your little taskbar that, that is with the webinar, and I will be monitoring that question, um, that question section throughout the evening, and we will try to get to as many of your questions uh, as we can, but of course we want to be respectful of your time as well and hope to get out of here before eh, sometime around 9, 9, 15 Eastern time. So today we're going to be focusing primarily on the story of the Nativity, and both Matthew and Luke tell the story of the birth of Jesus, and Dr. Peter Brown, first of all, just in terms of the basic events, what do we learn from each of those gospel accounts? Well, you, you sort of get a, uh, two different areas of, of emphasis, if you kind of look at them individually, um, the, the Luke story, the Lucan story sort of uh, celebrates Mary more, it celebrates the Annunciation, it um, has some really interesting foreshadowings of, of Jesus' death, um, it also emphasizes Jesus' um, royal heritage, uh, as, as the Matthew version does, but the Matthew version in some way um, probably emphasizes Joseph a little bit more, um, particularly Jesus' dismantling. <laughs> Uh, the Davidic line, which really comes through Joseph. So, um, and and so it also emphasizes Jesus' Davidic ancestry, but but in a kind of a somewhat different way. Um, and the other thing about Matthew too is that you know Matthew, uh, just like Luke does, he tells his story in light of the, of the Old Testament quite quite a bit. But there's a lot of really interesting parallels between Jesus and uh, and Moses in, in in the way that the story of the Nativity in Matthew is told. 
um, as opposed to the one in Luke. Dr. Bumstead, are there uh, theological differences that we encounter when it comes to these two gospel accounts? Yeah, well, first, uh, we can see in the, the, the narrative in Luke, in his infancy narratives, uh, a great historian at work. Uh, he, he fills a lot of very nice details uh, about the infancy, about the birth of our Lord. His focus uh, on Mary uh, can be assumed to be largely the result of his close um, friendship with the Blessed Mother. And of course, he, by ancient tradition, uh, used the Blessed Mother as one of the key witnesses for his gospel. And you can see that in the, in the rich details that he's able to offer. In particular, uh, the visit to Elizabeth, uh, the canticle, and then, of course, the different details of the infancy itself. He is also the, the, the person who gives us details regarding the census, and I know that's something we can talk more about tonight. In Matthew, what we're seeing is the, the strong focus on the Jewish community of the justification of the Messiah. And you can see then the, the, the focus on the genealogy of our Lord uh, with those particular details. But the other thing, too, is that we see in Matthew's account this fulfillment of salvation history. Uh, as uh, Dr. Brown is making the point, you can see the, the close connection to the Old Testament. But in Matthew, it's this historical reality of the descent of our Lord from the great line and the fulfillment of God's promise uh, in history, in salvation history. And you can see that especially in the use of the phrase Emmanuel, you know, that God is with us. So they both have great detail. Of course, we know that they probably relied a little bit on each other. But in Matthew, we have that salvation history that helps him then to lead forward uh, with his account of the defense of the Messiah. Well, actually, I want to follow up with that, Dr. Bunsen, because then was this the fullness of time? What does that mean? Yeah, well, we have uh, Pleroma. We have the idea of the, 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 the culmination point that had long been in preparation. You know, everyone loves to talk about uh, Scott Hahn's focus on the covenants. Well, we're seeing here that fulfillment of the covenants, but you're absolutely right. It is that the fullness of time, when time itself had reached, uh, that moment of God's incarnation into human history. And in that sense, then, Matthew is also justifying uh, all that had preceded it and all that was going to follow. Uh, Professor Wright, do you think that Matthew and Luke got their information on the nativity from different sources by any chance? You know, there's certainly a different emphasis to both the gospel writers after much time and reflection. And I would tend to say that they probably did. And as Dr. Bunsen said, the Luke's spending time with Mary, the Blessed Virgin, certainly gives us some of those insights. And I think by having you know, both of these stories, we, as we'll look into it, I'm sure, a little bit more in our discussion, but we do have certainly, you know, Matthew appealing to sort of a, the Jewish insiders and even the, the wealthy uh, with these wise men from the East, the Magi. And Luke's perhaps emphasis as he has throughout his gospel on the poor and the shepherds. And so, and they're the insiders as well. Uh, so when we have these stories together, we certainly have a, a story of the wealthy outsiders that come, but also the lowly insiders as well. And so while they're Emphasis may be a little bit different. I would also suspect that their sources were a little bit different as well. Uh, Dr. Carroll, I want to bring you in and, and just get your your take on, on the differences between the nativity accounts in, in Matthew and Luke. Well, uh, I, I, uh, I, I favor them both for different reasons. I absolutely love Matthew as a kind of... Um, uh, apologetic journey with Jewish people, you know, that they would be very familiar with the uh, insight, with the uh, prophetic words of the Old Testament. And so he's basically trying to lay out a, um, a set of stepping stones for, for Jews to see that this is the one we've been waiting for. Um, so I, I, I love that, uh, you know, sort of affection and attention to the Jewish people that he's kind of carefully laying out those those stepping stones that will hopefully help them to faith and help them to belief. Um, the Lucan, the Lucan text, uh, I, I enjoy more precisely for the reasons that were brought up uh, previously. Um, that sense of the Marian um, 
testimony in there. I, I last year gave a, a, a little uh, a little workshop on testimony to uh, to some young adults that were serving in one of our summer camps, and I was trying to, trying to teach them about the value of testimony. I said, how do we how do we know about you know all the things that happened uh, in the in the uh, uh, lead up to, to Jesus' birth? We know about them because Mary told somebody. <laughs> we know about them because of her testimony, and uh, kind of related to that. Uh, sort of a tangential uh, point, but um, isn't that the case? Uh, you know the beautiful uh, Black Madonna uh, mm-hmm. that, is in, that is in Poland, in, um, uh, where is it? Uh, <clears throat> it's not Chester. Krakow, it's North yeah. America. That's the whole way, yeah. Uh, it's reputedly uh, a drawing, and I think it's, it's, it's legendarily attributed to St. Luke on the back of a table that was in the mm-hmm. Holy Family's household, if I'm not mistaken. So, I love the, the concreteness that, that uh, Catholicism and the history and the tradition of Catholicism lend to the, uh, you know, the, 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 the story that we get from, from the Gospel. There are actually these other very tangible um, connections that we can make in the, you know, the Christian history of Europe. So, um, so anyway, that's, that's a, 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 little, a few thoughts from me. Interesting too, isn't it, Professor Wright, that, that you kind of see the the story of the Nativity one through the eyes of Mary and then the other through the eyes of Joseph. Yeah, it is really uh, a fascinating. I think it's you know certainly the the work of the Holy Spirit working through, through these two authors that bring us these stories that we can see you know certain things in the whole stories that will I think play itself out. We'll see coming up a little bit later on in the Gospels as well. I love even in, in Matthew's Gospel, really the, the first title given to Jesus as King of the Jews is on the lips of these foreigners. And, you know, Matthew, of course, is writing to a predominantly Jewish audience, and yet even these foreigners recognize there is something special about this child. And, of course, at the end of the Gospel, we see that phrase again, the King of the Jews nailed above his head. So there are certain themes that I think that go through each that uh, as you read the infancy narrative and even go through the, the cycle of the lectionary, that begin to really sort of come together in the mind of uh, each of these gospel writers. Uh, uh, Dr. Hudson, what was going on in history? I think a lot of times we, we look at it and we think of it just as a story, right? And we, we often forget that it actually happened at a real moment in actual history. What was going on in history at the time that Jesus was born? Well, you had uh, the Herodian dynasty. Um, there are a lot of questions about who exactly was still alive at the time of the birth of our Lord. There, we can talk more about this, of course. Was Herod the Great still alive? Was was he deceased at that point? The general date for the acceptance of Her- Herod the Great's death is probably around four BC. Uh, but what we can see is the deterioration of his dynasty. His sons and his relatives have been ruling the area. And of course, the great power of the age, the Roman Empire, was omnipresent uh, in that part of the world. They saw Palestine as a great buffer between the provinces of the east and what was beyond, which was largely the pagan Persian Empire that was always a threat uh, to Rome. Syria was the headquarters for a large portion of the Roman army in the east, which is why you have in Luke the focus, for example, on Quirinius, the governor of Syria. To be governor of Syria was one of the most important posts in the whole of the Roman Empire, certainly in the east, because that was, as I was saying, the gateway to defending the Roman Empire. But also you had the obligation then of holding uh, those territories that had been acquired by Rome in the previous century through war and political acquisition. So you had incompetence, such as Archelaus, uh, the relatives of Herod, uh, who was removed essentially for incompetence. You're beginning to see the, the, the presence of the Romans in Jerusalem and elsewhere, leading, of course, to the appointment of uh, procurators like Pontius Pilate, uh, who had constant difficulties with the Jews who were chafing under the idea of these <laughs> pagan governors, pagan armies occupying their land. 
And they were dissatisfied as well with the Herodian dynasty because they, they weren't considered authentically Jewish. They were Hasmoneans. And, and so what we're seeing is a great level of dissatisfaction in the East during this time, a great deal of political and religious uh, upheaval of foment. And you combine that with the messianic expectations that were so much a part of this era as well. So right at the time when our Lord was born, you have... Palestine sitting at the very juncture of the Roman Empire in the East, unsettled politically, unsettled religiously. And it is into that world that our Lord was born. Wow. Wow. Now, I want to, you mentioned Quirinius and, and Dr. Peter Brown. I want to ask you about that because uh, the Gospel of Luke talks about that census, but aren't there some historical issues with Luke's recounting of that census? Yeah. So this is. Matthew, Dr. Bunsen said uh, the, the most common date for the for the uh, end of the Herodian dynasty. Back there, can you hear me? Okay. There you are. I lost you for a second. There, there, there is a, there is a theory that's come about lately that pushes it as late as, as one BC, but so that's right. And, and both Matthew and Luke agree that the infancy narrative took place in and around the end of the Herodian dynasty. Luke kind of starts off in the days of King Herod at the very beginning of his gospel. Um, however, in chapter 2, uh, Luke dates the infancy story of Jesus to right around the census uh, during the time of Caesar Augustus. That's not the problem. The problem happens in Luke 2, 2 when he goes on to say that this took place when, when Quirinius was governor of Syria. The problem with this is, is that uh, Quirinius did not become governor of Syria until about 6 AD. Uh, that's when Archelaus was, was deposed. And that's really, almost everyone agrees, is much too late to have been the time of the birth of Jesus, which probably, you know, if you're following the chronology, chronology carefully, uh, took place maybe one or two years before the end of the reign of King Herod. So... That's, that's kind of an historical uh, difficulty. I don't know that we'll ever come up with a totally adequate solution to that one. But one suggestion is, is that, well, maybe there was another census before uh, that. And, and that could have certainly been the case that there was another census earlier, but it wouldn't have been under Quirinius. So that's, that's as far as we know, is a difficulty. I'm not really sure what the, uh, uh, if, if there will ever be a solution to that one. Does it discount Luke's account? <laughs> Well, um, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think in some ways, I think you have to realize that um, the historicity of the Gospels is, um, it, it's, the, the church's view of the historicity of the Gospels is, is nuanced. In other words, it, it definitely is based on things that happened historically, um, but it, it's not really clear whether Luke is, you know, able to really tell us um you know, exactly sort of a, a photographic, you know, account of what really happened. And so in, in some ways, what we have in the gospel accounts is is history, but but there's a great deal of, of theology as well. And, the, 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 you know, the way I look at it is, I think, more in the context of the literature and the narrative, the purpose of, of the census in the story is, is for Luke to explain why it is that, you know, at this time of the birth of Jesus, that the Holy Family took the, the journey that they did from Galilee uh, down to Bethlehem. Um, Which brings me... Oh, sorry. So. You're starting to, to get jarbled up again there, Dr. Brown. Uh, you actually led me seamlessly into my next question. Professor Wright, why did they have to be in Bethlehem? Yeah, it's a good question and just maybe just to go back a little bit to what Dr. Bunton was saying that when you're actually in the Holy Land really in the shadow of uh, Bethlehem there is the Herodian one of the, the palaces of King Herod so really Jesus was born in the shadow of this government uh, of oppression that you know that he spoke about and again for Joseph going to uh, back home to the city of David for the uh, the census and you know, this was sort of a certainly a man's world where he did not need to bring Mary, and yet for that sort of protective, we would say that protective love of of mother and child, that that was the reason that brought uh, Joseph uh, into his hometown of, of 
death for him. And what is the significance, theologically speaking, why did Jesus have to be born in Bethlehem? A directed at me. Well, yeah. you can go back to the to the Old Testament prophets in terms of uh, you know, being from the city of David, uh, the root of Jesse, and you know, sort of fulfilling that prophecy from Isaiah of uh, you know the Messiah coming from this town of, of Bethlehem. Yeah, from, from uh, I think it's from uh, Micah, right? So um, in, in you, Bethlehem shall be shall not be least among the rulers. First from you shall come the uh, what, what's the exact line here? It's it's the prophecy of Micah, I think, right? Um, so here's an interesting question. Can you hear me? Yeah, go for it, Jennifer. Can I can I can I throw an interesting question in there? Is it possible that um, Mary and Joseph were familiar enough with the scriptures that they might have gone to Bethlehem on purpose because they knew that's where the Savior was to be born? Yeah. Anybody got an answer? No. Because, I mean, I suppose I, a lot of the, you know, kind of conversation around Mary and her, you know, her familiarity with the scriptures and, <clears throat> you know, her, her Magnificat is very scriptural, it's you know, very related to uh, Miriam's prayer in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, if, if she if she knew she was to be the mother of David, could she have, could she have proposed to Joseph, you know, maybe I should come with you, you know? <laughs> I don't know, that's just sort of a, an interesting, a, you know, conjectural thought, you know? Um, I like that. I like the question that you threw it out there. It certainly does give Mary a little more of an active role in, uh, yeah, you know, in yeah. the story. Sometimes we just think of her as being so passive. And I know Joseph has mentioned, what is it, 17 times and doesn't say any words, but certainly right, a, yeah. a, a bit of witness. And yet it'd be interesting yeah. that Mary sort of does take control of the situation, perhaps. And, and it's a yeah, nice yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, um both the, the Lucan and the Thea narratives in the sense of... Uh, we yeah, have Mary's uh, active participation in all of this uh, in helping mm -hmm. bring about the, the fulfillment, as we've been saying, of salvation history. A couple of uh, other yeah. points might be worth discussing relative to the census. Is for the Romans, it was always very important uh, to know their population, especially in occupied territories, not just for the taxation purposes, but for distribution of population where they were going to put their resources for forts and the distribution of cohorts for the different legions, especially in areas that they deemed to be troublesome. So we know from historical records that there were a number of censuses, uh, certainly prior to the time of Quir uh, Quirinius. And I know that I think it's uh, the, the scholar N.T. Wright, and feel free, uh, Pete and, and everyone else, to debunk this. But N.T. Wright's argument uh, regarding uh, in Luke 2.2, 2, was this the first census? In other words, is he using, I think, the Greek protos? Uh, is he, in fact, referring to uh, Luke's reference for his audience, which would have been familiar enough with the census of Quirinius 6 AD, that is he, in fact, possibly referring to something that happened before that? If that's the case, then it might have been an earlier census. This was the first enrollment, but it doesn't, yeah, it, it does It does place it during the reign of Quirinius, though, right? So that, 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 I think, is the only problem with that idea. There certainly could have been earlier census. I, you know, I, don't, I don't doubt that. Right, unless, though, he's talking about uh, the use of the, the term before rather than first. Oh, before, before Quirinius was governor? So yeah. Um, right. Yeah, I'd have to look at that one. That's interesting. I'd have checked the Greek on that. Um, yeah. <coughs> If we jump ahead just very briefly into Luke's next chapter, what do we read? We Again, Luke putting a very clear emphasis on time and date. Uh, he talks about, uh, I think in, in 3.1, he talks about in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. Now we know that Tiberius uh, succeeded uh, Emperor Augustus in 14 AD. So right. that would put us at 29, 28, 29 AD. And that gives us some justification then for the argument about a, a, a census in 1 BC. So if, in fact, our Lord began his ministry around that same time. So it's, it's one of the reasons I think Luke is so valuable as a historian. And to go back to your question, Annie, about the historical facts, these little nuggets of history that are actually tucked so perfectly into the gospel narrative. Yeah. Um, I want to move away 
from from the history side of things for a second, and I want to bring Dr. Carol Brown. I want to ask you: Do you think did the circumstances of Jesus's birth line up with Israel's expectations of the Messiah? Oh boy. Um, <clears throat> Okay, well, you're you're not talking to a scriptural expert here, okay? So uh, that's not, that's not my uh, that's not my discipline. But um, uh, yes and no, I would say. Um, I would say they needed a bit of hand holding, which is why I think Matthew's uh, um, account of the gospel is so important for the Jewish people. Is that one after another, he 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 helps them to connect the dots between. The Old Testament and the life of Jesus, one after another. I mean, it's just it's just one after. This was to fill the prophecy. Of, this is to be over and over again in, in Matthew's Gospel. He says that. Um, now, uh, having said that, yes, it was, it's the the life of Christ was all was very much predicted in prophecy. However, in popular expectation, uh, I think that at the time uh, the expectation was. Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, and please, gentlemen, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a, a, a tremendous expectation that the Messiah was going to provide political relief for them, that he was going to uh, advance the kingdom of Israel as a temporal kingdom, that, that, that Israel would, you know, would, would <clears throat> uh, assume a certain temporal authority over the rest of the world, and that would, that would be what the kingdom of God established might be, you know. Um, and then we get Jesus, you know, humble, meek, uh, preaching the Beatitudes, um, going around as a, a simple preacher, and, and then of course we have the, um, you know, the, the rather indecorous experience of his passion and death, um, which certainly was not uh, in the realm of their of their expectation. And yet, uh, again, and I, I can't tell you for sure if this is in Matthew, but the the, uh, the, 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 the dot connection that goes on between Old and New Testament, even with the death and resurrection of the, the, the passion and death of Jesus. Um, he's trying to show them, no, this, this is exactly what was predicted, you know, the connection to the suffering servant in Isaiah and, and so forth. So was it what was expected? Was it what was prophesied? Yes. Was it what was popularly expected? I don't think so. Um, I think it took a lot, probably a lot of... Um, a lot of processing after the uh, after the fact, and a lot of you know, St. Paul went and really studied the scriptures to see if he could, you know, uh, gather some understanding for himself of, of this encounter he had had on the road and this, this voice that he had heard saying, you know, I am Jesus who you are persecuting, and, and he had to rethink everything, you know. Um, so I don't know if that uh, sheds any light on your question or not, but that would be my take on it. Yeah, yeah, and and Professor Wright, I'd like to get your take too. I mean, do you think that that Israel expected their Messiah to, you know, be born in a manger in poverty? I would say probably not. You know, we have an interesting uh, story. You know, when Jesus goes back in Luke chapter four for the inauguration, he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth, and you know, politically speaking, Nazareth was very, very conservative as were most of these small villages and hamlets that we have in the, the Gospels. I think there are 27 cities, towns mentioned throughout the four Gospels. And outside of really Jerusalem, there are all these small villages. And, and Jesus goes back to Nazareth, which would have been a very uh, very conservative village. And we see this misunderstanding. And Jesus is speaking to the, the Amharats, the, the, the people of the land. And these are people that are persecuted, that are looking for relief. And in essence, it's almost a, the story of, you know, like the elephant stepping on the, the tail of the mouse. And you're talking to the mouse and, hey, there's an elephant standing on me. And yet the person says to the mouse, well, you know, you need to, to reform too. That you need to be a, a better person. And it's like, hey, don't be this huge elephant that's, you know, oppressing me. And yet, you know what, the emphasis of Jesus is, uh, I think, in the inauguration with the you know, as he sort of sets out his mission, we see this anger rising from the crowd. And it's really not what they expect in uh, what they were hoping for. I think certainly more of a, a political leader uh, to get rid of their day-to-day -day situation in terms of the oppression that they were. They felt everywhere when they fished, you know, to see if Galilee right there, the taxation uh, they saw in the military leadership and uh, 
almost everywhere they went. And so I think certainly the type of Messiah that Christ was, uh, that God deemed him to be, is certainly not what the, uh, the, the people expected. Dr. Benson, you have anything to add before I move on? Yeah, I go to uh, Micah 5 2. And, and, uh, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel. I mean, the, the expectation of many in Palestine in that era was for a political leader, a, a Messiah who would rise up and expel the foreign occupiers who had been oppressing them for so long. I mean, we can go all the way back uh, to the occupation of that region by the, the Babylonians, by the Persians, uh, Alexander the Great leaving behind uh, additional oppressors. We have the story of the, the, the Judas Maccabee. We have all of these political problems and the expectation then, the messianic expectation was nothing that actually came to pass, something far more glorious than what might have been thought. Uh, but how often is it the case that we have such low expectations uh, and miss in history itself, if they had actually been reading what was in Isaiah and Micah and elsewhere, they would have seen what was coming. But again, understandably in a lot of ways, the, the political situation there, the social situation, uh, blinded many uh, to the reality of what was there in front of them. I mean, I guess if you think about it, if he's, you know, of the house of David, I mean, David, they didn't, his father didn't expect David to be the one chosen to be the great king. That's true. That's true. Uh, can I just chime in on this point as sure. well? Um, you know, the, the, um, the, the oppressors that they perceived in their midst were, were, you know, very concrete, um, Sources of oppression, for sure, but what Jesus actually came to slave that, that to save them from slavery to was sin, and so from the from the moment of his um, beginning of his public ministry, when he he begins with the word repent, repent, the kingdom of God is near. You know uh, that the real slavery here is not the Romans. The real slavery here. Is your slavery to yourself, your slavery to your own sins, and your your inability to to be what God created you to be, which is to be a gift to one another, you know, uh, which I, I think we're very recently rediscovering that um, anthropology of, of of life as as gift, you know, which which has been so destroyed and disrupted in uh, in in with the advent of sin and the, and the history of sin in the human race. So Jesus. You know the, the salvation that he offers is is that freedom from that kind of slavery, and and in in uh, in contrast to the Romans, really the, the interior slavery to sin is is really the more oppressive factor really than, than the exterior slavery of the uh, of the Romans I think. So there there again is a, a misplaced expectation of what did he actually come to save us from? Right. And what kind of a kingdom was being inaugurated? Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bunsen, before uh, before I, I pivot away from from this conversation, uh, Joseph asked, "Do you believe that the success of the Maccabees against the I cannot pronounce this Seleucids uh, fueled the belief that they could succeed with the Romans, especially since Rome had just undergone the same civil wars as they had experienced?" Yeah, that, that, that's actually a very good point. It's easy to forget that. Uh... Uh, at the time, right at the turn of the history from BC to AD, uh, Augustus had been emperor since 27 BC, having overcome a lot of his rivals. So yeah, I think there was a sense that if they could make it difficult enough uh, for Rome, they might actually be able to free themselves. But there's also uh, a deep awareness of the great struggles in the past, that somehow they had uh, been able to overcome the great conquerors in the past. And so I think there was this belief that uh, they might be able to do this politically. But the problem was that the situation uh, was so completely different, and they had not really reckoned, I, I think, with the power of the Roman Empire and its ability to make resources, but also to wear down enemies, two things that really the ancient world hadn't seen uh, since the, the time of the, the Babylonians and the time of the Assyrians who were, who were willing to do pretty frightful things to their enemies. 
And so, yeah, I, I think there was a belief that uh, they could make it so difficult, uh, which is something that we saw, of course, in 70, uh, with the Zealots, uh, that the, the, the struggle for Jerusalem, they reckon, they believed, would be so costly that the Romans would give up, when, in fact, the Romans were willing to obliterate almost the whole of Palestine uh, rather than surrender and then rebuild under their own terms. Yeah, and, and the event of the Maccabees, there was really uh, yeah, eschatological kind of fervor in the air, and that's exactly right. I mean, the idea was that you know God had had actually enabled you know almost by a fluke that this sort of tiny band of, of rebels at Modi'in to uh, to kick out uh, and ultimately defeat um, you know the, the what was left of the of the old Alexandrian Empire and maintain a certain uh, Kind of independence for a while, and you know, if, if God could somehow manage that one, certainly, um, given what all the prophets have said and everything else, you know, it's it, it's you know a small thing for him to uh, to, to overturn a, you know an earthly empire. And you also had things like the Book of Daniel too. We we tend to forget the Book of Daniel was just, was this huge because the Book of Daniel had basically called for the the, the succeeding empires that. that uh, Dr. Bunsen mentioned a little bit ago, uh, Babylon, uh, Persia, uh, Greece, and Rome um, were going to fall in, in, in that particular order. And so it was only a matter of time before the last domino would, would fall. And, and what you needed was sort of a trigger event to, for that to happen. Well, Doc, I want to stick with you, Dr. Peter Brown, um, was because I want to talk about the story of Jesus' birth itself now. Um, was, was Jesus born in a cave? <laughs> Uh, it's possible. Uh, the Gospels don't mention anything about a cave, though. And that tradition, like uh, a, a number of, of the traditions that we have, comes from a later account, uh, which didn't make it into the Bible, called the Proto-Evangelion of James. Certainly and, possible. Yeah. Uh, Professor Wright, you have, I, I think you have a thought on this, too? Yeah, you know, it's uh, as someone who's had an opportunity, I'm sure many people have to, to go and study in the, the Holy Land, you, you get to meet the people. And culturally, the uh, Middle Eastern people are just known for their general hospitality. And the idea that Joseph, uh, a son, favorite son of the city of David, would be bringing his pregnant wife back and there's, there's no room at an inn. Again, this is a very small hamlet, a very small community. I think even in, from someone from New Jersey, if my sister-in-law comes and we live in a small place and she's pregnant, guess who's getting kicked out? You know, yeah. it's going to be me. It's going to be her. <laughs> and then, uh, this oh, idea yeah. that this phrase of this that Luke used that there was no room in the inn, and that word in Greek is that katalama, which really suggests a, a guest room. We also have Luke using a, another word for guest room or sort of hotel in the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, where it, that word in Greek is pandocha. Kalama, if you go to the Middle East, then right up until about the Second World War, uh, the homes are very simple, very humble, and there would be a lower area where the, the animals, and you'd only have one or two, these are poor people, that would come in for the night as well. And remember in Luke, I think Luke 14, Jesus said to the Pharisees, hey, even on the Sabbath, don't you untie your animals and bring them from the home. And so there was a, a main living room and guest quarters. And so probably, in my estimation, and a great uh, Dr. Ken Bailey, who recently passed away, he'd also lived there for about 40 years and came to this conclusion as well, that uh, there was no room in the, the guest room, the Catalama, so most likely Jesus was was born right in their, their main living area. So right. a lot of things did happen in caves back in the day. Uh, so we don't know exactly what their living arrangements were. But I tend to sort of lean to the fact that Jesus was born uh, in a home rather than influenced, as Dr. Brown says, by the proto-evangelism of James, yeah. out somewhere in a barn in the middle of Kansas. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's, and, and to, to, to sort of follow up on that, I mean, that certainly is a possible interpretation of what Luke actually tells us. If you read carefully what Luke tells us in, uh, about the birth of Jesus, just from, say, uh, Luke 2.8 to, um, I'm sorry, to Luke, Luke 2, probably 2.3 to, uh, on down to Luke 2.20, 
Um, there's nothing I actually said about a stable uh, or directly about the animals. The, the, the idea of, of the stable and the animals sort of comes from the idea that there's there's a feed box, a botany, uh, which, as uh, Professor Wright just said, is, is exactly the kind of thing that, that in a, uh, a home in Palestine in the time, you, you actually would have seen right up in, in, in the home itself, probably in actually two levels. Like there, there might be a human area, which would be like a yard higher, and then a little bit below that level would be the animals. And so, you know, the phrase no, no room at the end, it, it could just as well in the Greek be translated, they had no space uh, in their living accommodation. And so for that reason, they had to put the baby down, you know, at the animal level in the the fatne, the, uh, the the manger, which is the box that the animals feed out of, and I now obviously you know people get upset with this interpretation because it sort of um, you know challenges the the, the the popular piety that's been around for centuries. But this interpretation is not new. I mean, this interpretation was um, is, is at least five hundred years old, advocated by among other people the great bro, the philologist Brosense in uh, in Spain in the sixteenth century, but there, um, the, the one advantage of this interpretation I will point out is that it, it reconciles what, what is a kind of a tension in the two accounts between Matthew and Luke. If you, if you follow Matthew's account very carefully, when the Magi get there, we're told explicitly it's a house, it's an oikos where Jesus is, is staying. There's nothing about a barn or a stable. And, and even if you just follow the Luke account, there's like a 40-day period where Luke and the Holy not Luke, but the Holy Family are going to be there before the presentation of Jesus in the temple. And it's, it's considerably easier to imagine that having happened in a, a place where Joseph would stay. And, and just the very fact that Joseph had to return to Bethlehem as his own city, um, the idea seems to be that there's sort of a family connection there, that either Joseph has an ancestral home there um, that, that he's going to take Mary to, um, and, and so... That's why he's that's why he's going there for the census um, because of because of the film and moreover Luke also tells us that that the Holy Family the Holy Couple is betrothed and and this is also the pattern of Jewish weddings that they would they would leave the bride's house and then they would go to the groom's house and the bride would live with the groom in in the groom's family home that that's the pattern and so um, there, there's a several clues to, to suggest that that the the stable interpretation may not in fact be the uh, the correct one. It's still a possible one, but um, the, the word uh, kataluma, which which is the word uh, Dr. Wright said, is, is actually also the word for the upper room in, in uh, the the um, uh, the passion narrative as well, where they celebrate the last the last supper. I'm not saying it's the same place, but it's the same words. Um, Dr. Bunsen, what did what did Pope Benedict say about all this? Yeah, so I was going to say that uh, let's not also lose sight of the, uh, the theological aspects to all of this, and, and that is uh, Pope Benedict, as he always does, uh, is, is putting, gets right to the heart of the matter by looking at this from the standpoint of there was no room at the end. In other words, tying this directly to John 1.11, you know, that Jesus came to his own home and he was rejected. Uh, so we have on the one hand the no room at the end, the rejection of the Holy Family uh, by Jesus' own people uh, coming back to the, the very place of the family. We have John's rejection of an account of the rejection of our Lord. And asking them the, the, the two important questions. The first is, how would we react? Uh, do we have room in our own inn? Uh, are we willing to accept the Holy Family? But the other is that the question of humility, that our Lord was not to be born, the Son of God was not to be born in splendor, in riches, but to be born in abject humility, uh, to come into the world uh, defenseless and completely at the mercy of others, dependent upon what? Upon love. And uh, Pope Benedict really stressed all of those themes in his, his various Christmas homilies, but I think that one especially uh, is a memorable one. Uh, Dr. Dr. Peter Brown, um, were animals actually present for the birth of Jesus? 
I think it's probably like, pretty likely that they were, although Luke, neither Luke nor Matthew tells us anything about the animals. But the idea of the animals um, comes from a very creative uh, medieval reading, sort of rereading of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, and Isaiah 1, 2, um, where we hear the famous saying, an ox knows its uh, master, an ass knows its, uh, its, its ruler, um, or its manger, uh, but, but you, Israel, do not understand. And so you have the, the ox and the ass there, with the same word for manger, and so so the, the ancient sort of way of reading the Old Testament is to kind of zoom in on these little hook words, like the word fatne, uh, the word for manger is present in Luke, it's also present in Isaiah uh, 1, 1, and 1, 2, and so uh, there, there's kind of kind of a, a blending of those things, and so you, you have the, the ox and the ass now sort of recapitulating the story, um, that where the ox and the ass don't know before, now they do know because because they're there. And so it's exactly where they should be because now um, the ignorance of Israel is going to be reversed because Israel is going to going to figure out eventually um, that that her 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 savior and Messiah have come. And so so it's, it's a very beautiful way of uh, sort of tying together the Old Testament and the New Testament. Although um, you know strictly speaking, it, it may not be exactly historical. Uh, certainly. Very believable that there were animals there. And, you have and the, the, the Jews oxen. and the Gentiles. Who's the ox and who's the ass? Sorry, just well, wondering. If you're reading G.K. Chesterton, the ox would be Thomas Aquinas and the ass would be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Just had to get that one in here. <laughs> You know, sometimes I've been uh, guilty at this time yeah. of year when uh, Christmas parties. Uh, I'll look at the beautiful nativity scene and I'll make sure I get that the ass and the oxen from out behind the, the back and make sure that both those characters are focused on Jesus in the manger. My wife hates it, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, and I've only done it to one lawn ornament, so she didn't like that. Okay, that. I think it does focus us as well that who is our owner and oh, where do we get our nourishment from? That Jesus, who was born in the house of bread, Bethlehem, came for us the bread of life. And three times Mary focuses our attention to that major. Uh, Professor Wright, was Jesus actually born on December 25th? You know what? Growing up, absolutely the 25th. And it came a time in my life where I think, you know what, you, you do a little historical research, and I'm sure. Dr. Brunson can add some of that, but I think more and more lately in terms of my research, uh, I'm being convinced that the 25th is the right day. And two, for two reasons. Number one, I think because Mary was there. And Mary, as Luke's, uh, or as Luke had Mary as probably a primary source, you're not going to forget that. But I think theologically, whether it's shepherds in the, the hill country of Judea or out in the plains of Wyoming, that the time for the birth of lambs is in mid to late December. You know, when they said that shepherds are in the fields, I was thinking back to, to Deuteronomy where after you, uh, you know, you after you plow your field, you're supposed to, what, after you clean the field, you leave the corners for the widows and the orphans, and then the, the foreigner can go through the field and pick up what was ever left behind. And after that, then the shepherds could come into the fields. And that was usually after the first harvest. But shepherds were also in the fields with their sheep when the newborn ewes, lambs, were born. And so it's been my experience speaking to shepherds, both here in the States, not so much in New Jersey, believe it or not, but whether it's in the, you know, the Midwest or in other parts of the world, that, that seems to be the general pattern, that a shepherd would be in the field taking care of a newborn lamb. So I am... I'm sort of, you know, I know the, the thing with the winter solstice and all that sort of stuff, but you know what? I think December 25th is probably, if I had to push a button, I'd say the 25th. Dr. Bunsen, I am curious, what is the the history of, of Christianity celebrating the nativity on the 25th of December? Yeah, well, one of the first things you have to say in response to that is I, I will wager that almost everyone uh, here tonight has probably heard somewhere along the line the claim that this was simply the Christianization, the acquisition of some pagan festival by the church. 
Yeah, that's yeah, I've heard that. That's taught in, that's been taught in seminaries for for decades. Um, that that this was the Christian answer to the feast of the young, unconquered son, which was celebrated on the winter solstice. So, um, but there's a better. I think there's a better solution than that, though. Dean, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, please. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll follow you up. Go ahead. No, 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 no. Did you? <laughs> Well, I, I, I was going to say, well, there's, there's really two theories, I think, uh, the, the, besides that one. The, um, the, the, the one that, that uh, I think is probably the most plausible is that it, it was based on the uh, dating of the uh, Feast of, of the Annunciation of Mary, which, which was in the spring. At March, March, that's March 25th. Now, that, of course, begs the question, why would you celebrate Mary's Annunciation in March 25th. We don't actually have that date given to us in, in the Bible. And the, the one theory that I've heard on that, which is plausible, is that there, there's sort of a tradition that the prophet is, is dies on the same day that he's conceived. And so um, we, we know the death of Jesus is what took place around Passover, and so that, you know, that would be a springtime event, and so that would, would also be his conception. The other theory, which I think is slightly less plausible than that, is the one that that is based on sort of a dating um, of, of Luke's gospel from from the point of view of Zechariah going in to offer incense in the temple. If you remember, there's two enunciations in the gospel of Luke. The first is the enunciation of the birth of John the Baptist. Then you have the enunciation of the birth of Jesus, and there's a six-month lag time between the two of those. If you assume that Zechariah is going to the temple in the, the time of incense to offer uh, incense, that's the, his number's up, and you assume that that's the Feast of Yom Kippur, and I think that's a dubious assumption, but if you do, and you situate that in the fall, um, that would mean that the Elizabeth would have gotten pregnant right around then, and therefore Mary, we know, at the time of her enunciation, Elizabeth was six months pregnant, and so um, that would put her conception right around early spring, if you, if you just count out the months and stuff, and so then you could also attach the date to Jesus' birth that way. Now, the problem is, with that interpretation, I don't think we have enough, nearly enough detail of, of what Luke tells us about the offering of incense to, to say that that definitely happened during the Feast of Yom Kippur or somewhere around that time. But it's an interesting idea, nevertheless. So I, I didn't mean to steal your, your no. thunder there, but maybe you want to add something to that. No, no. Your thunder is But uh, yeah, historically, what we know, too, is that I agree definitely with the, the first theory that you were uh, discussing regarding the, the, the march, the, the Annunciation, the, the, the death of our Lord, nine months uh, to Christmas. The other aspect is that uh, we find in the Church Fathers, very early Church Fathers, attestation to December 25th as being marked as the time of the birth of our Lord. That's significant because the typical theories that are given, uh, you mentioned Sol Invictus, which was given its first real impetus in the Roman Empire under Emperor Aurelian, and that's in, in the late uh, part of the third century. Christmas was already established uh, within the Christian community by that point, uh, and that was an effort uh, to bolster the, the pagan culture of the time. The other theory is of Mithras, uh, the, the fighting god, uh, that this supposedly was connected to December 25th. There is strong evidence now that uh, references to it because of the cult of Mithras developed very late uh, in the Roman Empire, in Roman imperial civilization. Uh, and some of the earliest references to it aren't until around in, in the Chronicon of 324. So what some of the thinking is that a lot of the Mithraic uh, acquisition of December 25th may in fact have been exactly the opposite of what we hear today, that it may have been actually trying to steal some from Christmas. So uh, there's a, a mountain of evidence now uh, in, in support of uh, a traditional Christian dating uh, to December 25th, certainly enough to refute any notion that this was the acquisition of a pagan I think We're simply uh, trying to co-opt uh, an older pagan festival. Very interesting. Uh, Dr. Carol Brown, I'm wondering what do you think is the significance, if any, of the fact that, that Christ's birth was first announced to the shepherds? Oh. 
feels yeah, like just, Bible quiz. Just a personal <laughs> reflection. I don't know if there's any theological significance or not. I'm certainly, you know, just looking for yeah, a reflection sure here. Uh, yeah, well, um, uh, what comes to mind is a, um, something that I read recently, sometime in the last year, I read something about um, the, uh, uh, the the poverty of our, of our Lord when he went through his kenosis, when he emptied himself of his divinity and and took on our humanity. Uh, the first announcement of that good news went to the lowest of the low, the poorest of the poor. Um, shepherds were the scum of the earth in uh, in that society, they were they were not thought to be honest. They were they were thought to be just you know they were just dismissed as a, as as you know almost subhuman, and yet they were the first to whom the announcement of the good news was shown. So they were honored uh, by the uh, by the announcement of of the presence of the king. And um, there's just something very beautiful, very beautiful about the humility of our Lord uh, to. <clears throat> To not announce himself first to, you know, kings and royalty and, you know, even Herod the Great, but to <clears throat> send the messengers, the angels, out to the hillsides where these guys are minding sheep, you know, and they smell like the sheep, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a rancher's daughter myself, so I know exactly what the Holy Father's talking about when he talks about the smell of the sheep, you know, it's not nice. Um, but that that's where the Lord goes first goes first to the most common salt of the earth, the people that think absolutely nothing of themselves, you know, uh, and um, and announces first that you're you're the first to know about this, and they and they, you know, they're invited to come and and give witness to the uh, uh, to the uh, holy family wherever they were, whether it was in a stable or whether it was in a, a family home or wherever it was, um, that they were they were the first that the Lord called and invited. To give witness to the the, uh, the incarnation of our Lord, the most astonishing, astounding, historical event ever in the history of the world—that God Himself became a man and and um, uh, revealed Himself to the scum of the earth first. Um, there's just something really extraordinary about that. You're, you're calling the shepherds the scum of the earth, and it's it's amazing. Um, you know, I I can tell you the shepherds even today. You know. Even by by Catholics, by Christians, you know they just don't get the same respect that the Magi do. Everybody loves the Magi. The Magi yeah. have names. The Magi have. There's a yeah. whole tradition associated with them. The shepherds, eh? Nobody cares about them. I mean, they, they're just there. Right? Yeah. Nobody bothered to know them. Nobody bothered to tell us how many there were. No, you know. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. like it's kind of sad if you think about it. They yeah, still yeah. don't get don't get their due from us. Yeah. Well, they yeah. smell like sheep. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, just this Sunday, I went to mass in a rural town here in Oklahoma, and um, I was giving a little talk and a little presentation out there. And uh, during communion, a young guy had gone up for the Holy Communion. He was dressed in these coveralls that were covered in manure, you know. And I knew he had come straight out of the dairy barn to come to mass, you know. And I mean, it was just one of those moments that kind of captures the extraordinariness of being Catholic, you know, that we are not. Uh, the white, polished, you know, um, you know, freshly scented, most beautiful characters that, that ever showed up. You know, we are we are the most common, the most mixed bag of folks that that come with uh, sometimes unwashed hands, unwashed clothes to receive our Savior and our King. You know, it's just a it's an extraordinary thing to think of of the universality of the Catholic Church that that, that this is extended literally to everyone. This invitation to be an intimate community with our Lord is extended to everyone. If if the Lord will reach out first to the scum of the earth shepherds on a hillside in the dark in Palestine, is there anybody, is there anybody who is excluded from this? No, there is not. Yeah. And, and Professor Wright, uh, you know, the, the shepherds, as soon as they, they hear from the angels, they make haste to to try to go find this child in swaddling clothes, much in the same way that Mary went with haste to her cousin Elizabeth after the Annunciation. It sounds like when you get visited by an angel, you you get a move on. <laughs> you should, and I think it's a, a great sort of point of evangelization as well, that Mary, who, who hears this word of God, you know, she'd what, in haste, 
And perhaps uh, maybe a, a different translation of that word for maybe American years is, you know, she did it eagerly. That she who had been encountered, you know, the presence of God has this desire to go to the home and share the good news. It's interesting that she didn't run to the temple, didn't run to the temple, but rather she goes to a home. And in the Magnificat, Mary becomes a, a master catechist and revealing what God has done through her. And it's interesting just to, to take a look at some of the titles of God on her lips as she speaks about what God has done for her. And I think with these shepherds as well, when they hear this news, and we hear that what? That this child is wrapped in swaddling clothes. This is not fine silk. This is not Egyptian cotton. And the shepherds must think, hey, we put our kids in that swaddling clothes as well. And he's placed in a manger. Well, you know, we don't have a fine crib from Nordstrom's, but hey, we throw our kid in the manger as well. So the idea that he came for the likes of us, right? That he came for yeah. the unwashed, that there's something attractive there, both for the, the wise men, the magi, but also for these lowly shepherds. I think that perhaps gives us hope as well. The beautiful story of the, the farmer in Oklahoma or the dairy farmer that, yeah, he is for us. Um, Dr. Bunsen, I want to talk about the, the Magi now because we've only got a few more minutes left before we've got to let everyone go. When did the Magi arrive to see the baby Jesus? Well, the uh, the account, let, let me jump back briefly, though, know, because I think this is a, there's a direct connection between the, the Magi and the shepherds. We, we see that in the account. Uh, there, there's a, a strong Marian dimension and also the shepherds. And what I mean by that is that historically, throughout the, the, the life of the church, the great Marian apparitions have typically been to the most lowly, to children, uh, to, to the, what the world would view as the simple, uh, the most humble. And we can see that very powerfully in this account, that the theophany, the angel often, in other words, the, the appearance of the angels, uh, was to the most humble. We then begin moving up sort of the, the social cast to the Magi. The Magi, Persians, Chaldeans, considered the most learned. Uh, they're, they're called by Matthew astrologers, and I'll, I'll leave it to the, the scripture experts to talk about uh, the exact translation of some of that. But these were, these were men who were clearly of means. Uh, they were learned. Uh, they were able to find the star. We can talk about what that means. But they were able to afford what would have been a caravan to, to find this Messiah. So their arrival then later comes after the shepherds have already been given the opportunity to recognize the importance of our Lord. Born in humility, revealed to those who are most humble. Yeah, uh, 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 Dr. Peter Brown, what was the star of Bethlehem? <laughs> well, so in the last three, four hundred years, you know, the, given the sort of birth of, of Gal post Galileo astronomy, that there's been a huge um, effort to try to find some sort of astronomical phenomenon to explain the star. You know, maybe a planetary conjunction. Um, maybe it was a shooting star. That's that looks really implausible. Maybe it was a supernova. Uh, you know, maybe it was a comet. So, so there, there's all these kinds of things. The problem with all of these explanations, though, is that they fail totally to explain how the star could do what it in fact did you know we're talking about <coughs> that leads people literally you know probably from persia which is now iran all the way across uh you know we're talking now a journey that probably would have been over over a thousand miles to uh to to judea to uh the place where the experts there at the time could but could then pinpoint the city where they had to go to, and then the star has to lead them directly over the exact house within the city. And you know, if you know anything about stars, they're they're enormous. They they cannot lead people to an exact place over planet Earth. And so, what we're really talking about here is probably more like a a, a glowing ball. Um, one you know very common ancient interpretation was that the the, the star was was really an angel. Um, sent for the ex explicit purpose of, of leading the Magi um, to the birth of, of birthplace of Jesus via the sort of scribes and the Pharisees. And 
I could add, you know, just as an aside, there is a deep theological point to be made about that, that, you know, the idea that natural knowledge only gets you so far, and you ultimately need to know the Bible prophecy of Micah to be able to make it to the exact point that you need to be, and that's exactly the way it happened in the case of the, the Magi. But the, um, the, the, the search for the Bethlehem star, you know, in terms of the astronomic records, I think is, is a rather unfortunate wild goose chase. I think what you're... What you're dealing with here is is a sort of a more preternatural phenomenon of of a star, you know, that's that's really an angel. And, and I wrote an article um, in our Sunday Visitor. It came out this time last year, you know, arguing um, wh why that's true, and that there's actually a very interesting connection between the sort of ancient uh, cosmogony uh, between angels and stars, which which the the ancient writer like Matthew is assuming, but which you know, we have sort of allowed in, in the post-enlightenment world we're living in to sort of gather a lot of dust, and we, we can only recover it with, with a great deal of effort. Email me that article. I want to read it. Okay, sure. Thanks. Thank you. Can I throw uh, one last finger in this? Yeah, please. I don't know. I don't know if we're. I don't know if we're in the absolute last few seconds, but this is uh, this is a question I'm asking as a student of the of the uh, exhaust uh, biblical scholars we have here, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, you may not know the answer to this question, but I was praying in the Liturgy of the Hours earlier, <clears throat> sometime this year, and I noticed that um, in the book of Daniel, uh, he was given the name uh, Belteshazzar, something like that, Belteshazzar, and I thought how curious that it was a name that was so close to the names that are traditionally given to the three wise men. There's one of them named Belteshazzar, yeah. right? And, uh, and I, I was thinking about the fact that three wise men came from Persia, would have been, which would have been roughly where uh, Daniel would have been, I guess. In, um, yeah, Daniel would be in Babylon. Yeah. Is, is there, I want to see the name that Daniel was given and the potential that, you know, perhaps there was a familial lineage that really held on to the prophecy. Uh, that uh, of the of the newborn king and and that that might have you know also guided their uh, uh, their um, expectations and uh, I don't know this is totally conjecture so it's just a ter terribly something I became terribly curious about a few months ago so I don't know uh, I've never thought of it before <laughs> maybe something to it I I think we probably would want to investigate. You know how the, the magi acquired their names to begin with before we went any further than that and i my yeah. suspicion is that's a, a probably later tradition as well mm -hmm. i that there were three of yeah. them the, the gospel doesn't actually say that there were three of them and and you know that that they all came they all have the backstory they all came from certain parts of the world and, and there's usually a racial or ethnic character <laughs> uh-huh uh, but, but I, I that's that's um that's way more than what Matthew tells us about them, but I don't know. Maybe yeah. Matthew okay. Might do that or, 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 we, need or, or, we need Hollywood to do a good prequel on Walt. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we'll watch for that. Um, I do want to get to uh, a couple of viewer questions um, before before we wrap things up here. Um, Dr. Bunsen, Joseph asks, the, regarding the slaughter of the innocents, just how many of these children could have been in Bethlehem? I don't know. Dr. Bunsen, are you there? Oh, we can't hear him. There. Okay, does somebody else want to yeah. take that question? Oh, wait, I think there's I hear you. A little bit of a fuzzy, uh, of a fuzzy connection, so apology. Okay. Um, what we read in the in the gospel account, of course, is that there was the slaughter ordered by Herod. Uh, the exact number we can't be sure, then uh, we find obvious parallels uh, to slaughters that in, in the Old Testament and uh, in ancient history itself to for a king to try to secure his throne. I mean, Herod had that great tradition of massacring his own family members uh, in order to be secure. So I, I, we can only surmise uh, as to how many infants there were at that particular moment uh, that would have fallen to the sword. Not like, as I was saying, I'll defer to our scripture experts uh, for their opinions in terms of the direct translations of things. But uh, the, the number probably would not have been enormous, but let's not underestimate the impact uh, that Herod's decision probably had on the region, uh, a reputation that was already as black, as dark as you could possibly mm -hmm. have. Yeah. Do either 
of you want to comment on that before I move on to the other question? How many how many infants there were? I, I think if you were the only way you could conjecture that is to sort of estimate the population in general in the area and then figure out just demographically how many there were. I've heard estimates in the in the dozens or a couple of hundred maybe. Um, so we're not we're not dealing with enormous uh, you know thing. So we, we, you know event you know in the sense of like this being like some earth shattering you know event that's going to make it into like Josephus or other historical accounts that, you know, people made much of the fact that this event is not something that, that was recorded. So ergo, the evidence of absence is the absence of evidence or the, you know, or vice versa. But, but in reality, you know, this is, this is entirely believable that something like this could have, could have happened. Um, why having lived through the 20, 20, 20th, early 21st century, we would be surprised that, you know, a ruler would, uh, massacre infants, you know, or massacre his own people for, you know, some sort of political advantage. And why that's so incredible for us to believe is, you know, is just beyond me. But um, there, there really is no proof of this beyond um, what the what the Bible actually tells us. But this is, I think, one of those those things that, um, to me, this is entirely plausible that something like this could have happened. Well, let's just say there are also good reasons why. Uh the old saying was that it was safer to be one of Herod's pigs than it was to be one of his children. Right. Yeah. That's, I think that's where we're going to have to end that discussion <laughs> on that happy <laughs> note. Exactly. Because um, <laughs> we are running out of time, and I want to let um, anybody that, that's still watching in right now, I want you to hang on to the very end because we actually have some CDU swag available if Dr. Brown goes, yes. <laughs> uh, but you have to wait until the end because I'm going to give you a special phrase that you have to write in to the questions panel in order to for that swag. Um, but first, uh, Professor Wright has a special seminar coming up in January called Missionary Discipleship, Charge This and Spread the Good News. And uh, you, can, you can register by going to HTTPS uh, colon slash slash uh, etc etc cdu dot catalog dot structure dot com and uh, you can be in place to register for it. It's available for the very low price of one hundred and sixty five dollars. Uh, Professor Wright, can you tell us a little bit about this seminar, real quick? Sure. You know the phrase missionary disciples comes from uh, Evangelium Gaudium, uh, the joy of the gospel one twenty, and Pope Francis says that uh, rather than just saying that we're missionaries or disciples, he really likes this term, uh, missionary disciples. And in the church, we have certainly a, a universal call to holiness, which I think most Catholics uh, sort of understand. I, I need to be good. I need to be holy. I have personal disciplines in my life. And yet that universal call to mission uh, is something that sometimes we sort of, you know, shriek behind a little bit. Uh, and yet we're called to be like Christ. And while there is no perfect program in evangelization, we do have the perfect person. Jesus, who continues to inspire and perfect our faith. So we'll have three uh, sessions, and we'll talk about what it is today to be a missionary disciple, look a little bit of the uh, historical, uh, through the saints and through the scripture of uh, people that really put flesh uh, in their actions and their faith that came alive. And what are some of those opportunities today for us, not only as individuals, but as people involved in ministry and parishes, to really be a, a model, a leader, and a catalyst for change in this area that the church uh, can take up its mission as a, a missionary church, and for us as individuals as a missionary disciple. Very cool. Pete, say it for me. I wait! <laughs> I wait! Today and tomorrow only, a special Christmas CDU gift to you. You can actually take this seminar um, if you are, are participating in this webinar for the special price of $79, um, and the, the promo code to enter for this seminar is CDU Advent 2016. Again, CDU Advent 2016. It's a great Christmas present, Dr. Brown. Well done. I like it. I like it. Um, so, like I said, Swag is available to, uh, I think, a couple of lucky 
people who have stuck it out till the end. If you write in the questions panel, I want CDU. I want CDU. You will be eligible to win, and the good people over at Catholic will be sure to uh, pick your names at random and uh, let you know what you have won. So I'll let you all, you know, get your get your I want CDU in. If you put extra exclamation points in, um, you get extra points. Um, <laughs> I just made that up myself. But anyway, I thought uh, we would close. I thought it would be appropriate to to close with the, the canticle of Simeon in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Protect us, Lord, as we stay awake. Watch over us as we sleep, that awake we may keep watch with Christ and asleep rest in his peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to give a special thank you, of course, to our panelists, uh, Professor Alan Wright, Dr. Peter Brown, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, Dr. Carol Brown, over the phone. Uh, a great discussion tonight, everyone. So thank you so much. And uh, once again, my name is Anna Mitchell. Hope uh, you can tune in and listen to the Sunrise Morning Show tomorrow morning, bright and early at 6 a.m. And uh, you can download the Sunrise Morning Show app at sunrisemorningshow.com. That's sun with an O, S-O-N, risemorningshow.com. So I look forward to talking to you tomorrow morning. Thank you, panelists. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Have a fabulous evening, everyone. God bless. Bye. Bye.